In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This morning, I would like us to reflect on a line from today's collect for a few minutes. That line reads, Lord of all power and might, increase in us true religion. Well, that's packed with a whole lot. And if we're being so bold as to ask God for true religion this morning, we'd better first be clear about this true religion. Otherwise, we might end up getting something we didn't bargain for. So let's take note of the initial reading from the Hebrew Testament and the Gospel reading as well. These two present examples of true religion. However, these two examples seem to contradict each other. In the reading from Deuteronomy, we hear a classic traditional definition of this true religion. It's a reflection considering a doctrinate pax of the ancient faith. Moses tells the people what God expects of them, that they should keep the commandments and observe the ordinances and statutes he is about to convey. Moses ends his great speech by further charging the people with the responsibility of passing all this to future generations, to make known to your children and your children's children. As a result, all the narrative history that follows the book of Deuteronomy is understood as a record of the people's struggle to exercise true religion. When Israel thrives, it's thought to result from the faithfulness of the Mosaic law. When times are bad, it's due to their unfaithfulness or even to the unfaithfulness of leadership. Over time, a few cracks have appeared in this straightforward understanding of how we should work. We hear this echoed in the book of Job, in the book of Ecclesiastes. But by and large, this lesson from Deuteronomy reflects the mainline theology of the ancient Hebrew faith. In our gospel lesson from Mark, we are confronted with a different and even contrasting slant on this notion of true religion. The Pharisees, those tasked to be the protectors and interpreters of the Mosaic law, are complaining to Jesus about the disciples' lax attitude towards the cleanliness node. Interestingly, the Pharisees never accused Jesus of improperly washing his hands. So one assumes that Jesus strictly adhered to the coat. But yet, in response to these complaints, Jesus firmly condemns the Pharisees for their hypocritical behavior. Then, to the surprise of everyone, he goes one step further and reinterprets the long-standing practices of the Jewish dietary laws. Now, this was a very radical thing for him to do. When we modern folk may find it hard to understand, it was in those days that a powerful spiritual connection was made in the mind of every Jew between food and the obedience to God. Issues around food were almost as a religious obsession in Jewish culture. So let me try and put it a different way, one that we might be able to engage a little bit deeper. I once heard a rabbi claim that where an average Victorian might have hang-ups about sex, an ancient Jew had hang-ups about food. Sex wasn't the major problem then. It was food, whatever you ate, whatever you ate with, and so on. So all the strict dietary laws around pork, unleavened bread, and kosher food, and all the endless do's and don'ts about preparation, The ancient Jews were almost neurotic about food rules. Freud would have enjoyed the practice of therapy today, but not so much back then. In other words, Jesus is messing with powerful stuff here. Notice that he 
never actually attacks the tradition itself, but condemns how it is used as a replacement for steadfast faithfulness. So what does all this mean? Is true religion a religion in which one upholds the commandments and ordinances of God? Or is there something else? Are some traditions more important than others in distinguishing true religion? And if so, which one? How do we define it? Who defines it? Who is the ultimate authority? Years ago, when I was in seminary, my professors taught me a term that over time has become quite helpful for sorting through all of this. The term from the ancient Greek is adiaphora. Now, please don't ask me to spell it correctly because it's been about 30 years and I can't remember that much, but the word means in essence something that is of indifference. Or as used in theology, adiaphora refers to something unnecessary to the faith. For instance, one might say that whether the acolyte lights the candles on the right side of the altar and then she lights the candles on the left is a matter of adiaphora. A proper candle lighting sequence is not necessary for faith. Now I know that may come as a shock to some of you, but there it is. (laughs) What one wears to church is a matter of adiaphora. Or to say it another way, God doesn't give a hoot if you wear a tie or a golf shirt or a leopard skin pillbox hat to church. The salvation of one's soul is not dependent upon a dress code. That doesn't mean you shouldn't dress nicely. It just means that doing so or not doing so is limited theological importance. Now I'm getting ready to tread on real thin ice here, but whether or not we use right one or right two is a matter of adiaphora. (laughs) Church furnishings, whether the chalice is silver or wood, the altar linens are properly pressed, or whether we have church pews or cathedral seating, is adiaphora. These may be essential issues on some superficial level, but not on a level necessary to the life of faith. What I'm saying is pretty obvious to most of you, and yet it is amazing how easy it is for us, all of us, to confuse what is important with what is essentially not really all that important and to raise human tradition to the level of critical theology. The trivial becoming elevated to the level of the eternal. We all are prone to this kind of behavior, even if not incredibly, the most well-intentioned among us. The trick is to know when we're doing it. Once we've lost our perspective, we're in trouble. Because you see, the trivial has a way of diverting one's attention from things that really matter. The Pharisees were so focused on the disciples upholding the cleanliness tradition that they missed the point. In the end is the man standing right in front of them, the man named Jesus, who bears their very salvation. This is an example of what Frederick Buechner refers to as looking at a window rather than through it. Now, if you look at a window, you might see the fingerprints, the cobwebs, the dead bugs, and the scratches left by Junior's Frisbee. But looking through a window, you'll see a world beyond. The Pharisees weren't able to look out of the window. Admittedly, it isn't always straightforward. 
telling the difference between what's essential to the life of faith and what isn't. Sometimes true religion can be a murky thing. For instance, right now, our own Episcopal Church is very much engaged in the struggle to understand what true religion is in reference to the liturgy and our prayer book. Many have come to believe that updating our prayer book is a matter of adiaphora. Others believe that it is primary doctrinal importance. At the very least, our church has different perspectives. What's truly important? When I hear this passage from Mark's Gospel, I think I hear the hint of an ethic in the story's background. As followers of Christ, you and I are the recipients of tradition, the same essential tradition that Moses presents to the people of Deuteronomy. That tradition where Jesus' heritage as much of it as ours. It's central to our identity and on some level to our faith. And yet, there's always more to our faith than mere tradition, ordinance, or commandment. It's more than, well, we've always done it that way. Or that's not the way we did it before. Why are we doing that now? At some point, we must examine our religious assumptions in light of our relationship with God. So back to the original question, what is true religion? Well, that depends. Does what we do and believe draw us closer to God and to others? Or does it simply displace God and others from the thrones of our hearts? Does it seduce us towards nostalgia and security? Or does it open us up to God's future and the power of the Spirit moving forward? Does it force us to look at people like windows, noticing their imperfections first? Or Does it draw our eyes and our souls out into a world that sees richness and beauty and challenge and opportunity and change? Does it enable us to love? Or does it simply distract us from our call to love? Does it make us Christ's disciples? Or does it merely make us Pharisees? In our walk in faith, these are the kinds of questions we might want to ask ourselves. 